Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Thank you for joining with me today. Uh, let me pray for our time together as we get started. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to talk about your word. May you guide and direct this sermon time. May you be glorified and helping us to understand the things you want us to understand. And may you guide me as I teach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my daughter McKenna has started running cross country this year, her freshman year at Southwest Christian High School. And I've really enjoyed watching her grow. Um, I love going to her meets and watching her compete, cheering her on. Uh, my wife even gets emotional uh, each race at the finish line as McKenna sprints to the end. It's really kind of fun to watch. And she's actually gotten really good at, at this. She's currently the second fastest runner on the girls varsity team at Southwest Christian and has sectionals this coming Thursday. And her personal records have, have dropped consistently throughout the season and her current PR is 2253. And for those of you who've never run cross country, they run a 5K in high school, which is about 3.1 miles. So that's just a little over a, a seven minute mile pace. That's how she's doing uh, now at the end of the season. Uh, but it's been a lot of work getting there. She started running in captain's practices this summer. She got up early and would run with the team four, me four times a week throughout the summer. Uh, they would run um, early in the morning. And then during the fall, they run every day after school. And most Saturdays, they also practice at 8 a.m. And uh, McKenna has had pain and soreness. And it's not always been easy, but it has paid off. Uh, at the beginning, she couldn't even always run the whole way. And her times were much longer. And uh, through the hard work and the pain and all that she, that she has gone through, she has developed her endurance and her muscles have gotten stronger and, and her running has matured. And She's taken several minutes off of her times and she's not done yet. She's continuing to grow in, in, in her endurance and we're looking forward to all that is still to come. Now, you may already see how this might fit in with a passage at, of scripture. And, and uh, um, for today, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of James chapter 1. Now, we're almost finished with our current sermon series. Um, over the past few months, we've been talking about uh, people from scripture who faced tough times to learn from them about what we, the tough times that we face. And um, we're going to wrap things up next week with a special communion and healing service. Um, so I encourage you to be preparing your hearts as you think ahead to that. Um, and that service is going to carry with it that tough time theme. And uh, we're going to look at come all who are weary and um, I will give you rest, which is what Jesus says. And um, we're going to have a time of sharing, and um, so if you can join us for that, I encourage you. But um, then in November, we're going to move on to a special missions theme and uh, have some special guests with us, and we're, then we're going to end the year by um, digging into Advent. And, but for today, I was praying about what passage to turn to for my final regular sermon in this Tough Time series, and I felt like God was pointing me toward a well-known passage in James 1. And Actually, I had to think about it for a bit because I don't like preaching here at the river uh, the same message or like a, on the same passage that I have preached within the last several years. And um, this passage is very familiar to me. It's been an important passage that God has used in my life. And so I feel like I talk about it a lot. Maybe you've heard me reference this passage in the past, but I checked. And as far as I can tell, I haven't actually preached on this river ever at the river, which is kind of surprising to me. Now, this passage is, is a little bit different than most of the passages that we've done in this series. The others have focused in on very specific characters and the tough times that they've faced, but this passage is really focusing on addressing the topic itself head on. It's more along the lines of dealing with what we should think about the tough times we face. Let's begin with a little background. What do you know about who the author is and who he's writing to? Well, the author is, is James, but that could be a lot of people. And, the most natural person I think for us to think about with James is James the disciple, the brother of John. And um, now it's not clarified for us in this letter itself, but most scholars seem to believe that rather than James the disciple, the author of this letter is actually James the half-brother of Jesus. Now notice that I said half-brother. That's because Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, right? And Joseph was more like his adopted dad, uh, adopted dad not his biological father. So for clarification, James was Jesus's half-brother. Now, he has an interesting story because from what we read in the Gospels, it seems like during at least part of Jesus' ministry here on earth that he didn't 
along with his other his um, other siblings, apparently didn't really believe who Jesus said he was. But at some point that changed, and James became not only a follower of Christ, but an instrumental part of the early church. And in this letter, James was writing to Jewish Christians who had probably been part of the congregation of the church in Jerusalem, but who had been dispersed to other areas due to the persecution that we see erupting after the death of Stephen, which is recorded for us in the book of Acts. Now, I want to make sure that we we hear that detail about how this letter is written to these Christians who have been dispersed out of their homes to other places because of persecution. I think that's significant for this passage for today because James begins his letter with a very personal encouragement for them to persevere in the face of trials. And we can understand from their context how that would be such a message that would come across to them. Let's take a look at James 1, beginning with verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So as we look at this passage today, I want to take some time and really think through the words and phrases that James is using here. For instance, what are trials? Well, this might make us think of like a courtroom trial, but the word itself is more along the lines of a calamity or affliction, um, as well as the idea of putting something to proof. Um, I think most of the time we tend to think of trials as being tough times that we face, which is why this fits so well as we wrap up the sermon series. But notice that James adds on the phrase of various kinds. What do you think of that? Well, I think he is suggesting diversity of trials because trials come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, right? Some are painful and maybe even harmful um, to us, while others are maybe just more difficult or stretching kinds of times. Some are physical in nature, like sickness or pain in our bodies or financial issues or very real and tangible hardships we face. Some may be more emotional or like going through grief or sorrow or anxiety. Others could be spiritual, like temptation or doubts or even uh, maybe relational tough times like marriage issues or broken relationships or facing gossip or accusations. Some trials are based on external pressure like the persecution the early church faced or other times it might be more of an internal struggle that those around us may not even see. I think James intentionally uses that phrase of various kinds to allow for the diversity of trials as if it could fit any kind of trial that we face. And James doesn't really even leave it open to the idea that maybe we won't face trials. He, he doesn't say if you face trials, but rather when. He's implying that in the normal journey of the Christian faith, or just life in general, we're going to face trials. We're going to have tough times. We should expect them. With all that in mind, then, what do you think of the way that James is calling them to consider it all joy when they face trials? Well, joy and trials are two words that we don't tend to associate together, right? Our typical response is to loathe trials because it mean, they mean discomfort and pain and suffering and struggle or things like that. But James is not saying that we should enjoy those times or, like, or that we should like them or like going through them. That word joy suggests something different than happiness. It's not about smiling our way through adversity as if we're immune to it or don't have a care in the world. James is saying that there is some value in the trials we face, something that we could recognize as being good, even if the time itself is tough. He then goes on to tell us what that value is. He says, because the testing of your faith develops steadfastness. Now let's break that down. How would you define faith? Well, Hebrew says that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. When I talk about my faith in my gospel class that I teach at Crown College, I talk about how it is more than just intellectually agreeing with something, it is actively trusting in it. Like if I believe that a chair will hold me, that's not having faith in the chair, it's just intellectual agreement with that notion. And it's not until I actually sit down in the chair that I'm actually exercising faith. So it's believing something to be true and acting as if it is, even if we can't see it. So then if that is faith, what is testing? Well, maybe one of the things that comes to mind from our recent um, current events is COVID testing. Now that's not a fun thought. We get the idea of seeing if something is positive or negative, testing to see if something is true, right? Or like in school, testing to see how, how well we know a subject, we pass or fail. Now the word itself, um, 
means it, it refers to the means by which something is tried. It even carries the idea of a trial, which harkens back to our early word. Um, trials try our faith is kind of what this is saying, right? But I think that it's not just about passing or failing. I, I think of the concept of the testing of a product that we see companies do where they test it to see if it will pass a, or fail a certain test, but with the idea of making it better and it continuing to work it out until it is ready. James is saying that the trials or tough times we face serve a testing role, maybe exposing the weak areas of faith, but not only do they expose or reveal the weak areas, but um, they also serve to strengthen them making them stronger. That testing produces or develops steadfastness. So what is steadfastness then? Well, this is a Greek word that is sometimes translated as patience or perseverance or endurance. One translation I saw used the phrase patient endurance. I kind of like the combination of those two things. It suggests something that continues to endure even through difficulty. It carries with it the idea of tenacity like being an un under a heavy weight, but continuing to stand firm or, or standing strong even in the fiercest storm. So what does the idea of steadfastness then add to our faith? Well, this is where I like that idea of perseverance, a faith that perseveres has developed strength and stamina to continue on, right? Like my daughter running cross country, all of those early morning runs in the summer and after school this fall and on Saturday mornings when everyone else was still in bed, her body was getting stronger as she ran. And now her times have dropped significantly and she is a, a stronger runner who was able to persevere and endure in ways that she couldn't do just a few months ago. And notice that James says that steadfastness must have its full effect. Another way of saying that is it must be brought to completion or must carry out its intended purpose. It suggests time. It doesn't just happen overnight or easily. It's just an ongoing testing and trial process that produces growth. And eventually that leads to it being perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What do you think of that phrase? Well, the original wording suggests a, a completeness or wholeness. Elsewhere, it might be translated as maturity, like the idea of growing into the fullness of who God created us to be. So overall, this is a very interesting picture that James is painting for us. And it fits really well with our Tough Times sermon series. And um, I wanna ask you, what do you learn then from James's words that can help us when we face our own tough times? Well, I wanna end by taking us back to two words. And the first word is from the beginning. James begins with the words, consider it pure joy. I wanna point out that word consider. So this is referencing how we think about something, right? James is not telling us how we should feel in, in tough times, but rather how to think about them. That's an important distinction. It's okay that tough times are tough. It's okay that we find ourselves discouraged or in pain or in grief or sorrow or confused or doubting or tired or whatever else we might feel. It's okay that tough times are tough doesn't mean that we're not good Christians or that our faith is not good enough or that there is something wrong with us. Even as we grow in maturity, this passage suggests that trials will continue to come until we get to heaven, that there's still more that can continue to strengthen and stretch us. And with that in mind, James says then, consider it pure joy. He's not telling us how to feel, but how to think. He's challenging us that even though the time is tough and we don't want to face it and don't enjoy it, even though we may feel discouraged or afraid or confused or in doubt or in pain or grief or tired or whatever it might be in the midst of those feelings, we can look through all of that and see that there is some value in going through the experience itself. The second word that I want to take us to is the word teleos. Now, this is something I just saw this time as I, as I was studying this passage for this sermon. And it, it's obscured a little bit in translation, but it's a word that is used twice in verse 4. In the ESV, it is translated the first time as full effect and the second time as perfect. In the NIV, it's translated as finishing its work and then as mature. And you can see how those words kind of interrelate. Basically, the original word means brought to completion, fully accomplished, fully developed, fully realized, complete full grown, but it's the same word used twice. So in the original Greek, it, it would read more like, and let endurance carry out its intended teleos so that you may 
be teleos and complete, lacking in nothing. Isn't that interesting? It suggests to me that if I choose to look at trials the way God wants me to, I can see the trials themselves have embedded within them the intended purpose of accomplishing fullness in me. That without those trials themselves pushing my faith to endure, I can't really become the fullness of who I am supposed to be. That as my endurance matures, so do I. Through trials, our faith is tested and it reveals the weak areas. And as we submit ourselves to God in those trials, those weak areas are strengthened and our faith is able to endure more. And that process continues to the fullness of what our faith is supposed to be like. And it won't be done until we get to heaven, but it's continuing here on earth. And that's beautiful and good. And if we can see that, then we can see the inherent value embedded in the midst of the tough times we face. And we can consider it joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fact that in the midst of trials, even you have embedded this value of strengthening our faith and our endurance, bringing us to maturity in you. Help us to see that and to consider it joy when we face trials and to recognize your work and to, to let you work in the midst of it, trusting in you, letting you strengthen our faith and bring us to the maturity you wanted to bring, want to bring us to. Be glorified in us, work in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.